All right, hey everybody, and welcome to the 90 Minute Art Challenge. I'm your host, Bobby Chu, and I also have on here my co host, Masei Seki. Hey, Masei. Hello. Hey, Bobby. Aren't you excited today? Mm hmm. Because I'm we have excited. A guest. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, one of our absolute artistic heroes. If you haven't guessed, it's because you can't read. It says Nathan Fawkes. Holy smokes. He is our guest artist for today. All right, so. What are we going to do today, Masay? Can we kind of explain it to the crowd here? Because we're going to be doing a collaborative piece today, right? Yep. So today, Bobby and I took one of Nathan's beautiful, beautiful paintings and used that as our inspiration and tried to come up with our own little composition and story. And working together, was that was pretty interesting because we're both painting at the same time and uh, as we're talking, we're like trying to discuss like, oh, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do this. Yeah, we're That's working out some thumbnails well, guys, right now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Nathan. It's uh, one of, yeah, it's one of my favorite paintings too. So I'm, I'm very happy that you picked this one. Oh, awesome. This is from a production that never came out, right? <laughs> it never. In fact, uh, I, I mean, I could tell stories about this. It was a great production to work on. But uh, the studio folded, and uh, many of the artists did not get paid. The good news about that is, hey, I own this painting because I was never paid for it. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of happy rights to the painting. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that would love to join us on this challenge, please do. Um, but before, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. What I want to do right now is I want to... Um, Jeez. All right. Let's see here. I'll put it down here. All right. And then, oh, sorry. Just doing a little moving around here. All right. So here we go. The thing I want to show you today is Nathan Fowkes, his Instagram. Look him up right now before you forget. Nathan Fowkes Art. You could go there to Instagram and then you can um, follow him because... It's an amazing resource. You know, not only does he do charming posts, uh, there's a lot of really amazing resources here uh, and inspiration that I'm sure many of you are going to want to save and uh, keep. Also, I want to mention if you want to get a closer look at this image, you can go to tumblr.com hashtag. Uh, or look up 90 Min Art Challenge, and then you'll find all the different challenges here. This one's for tomorrow, for Thursdays. And just underneath that, there's today's, and it's Nathan's painting. Okay, so you can see it nice and up close. Um, and the other thing is, when you're done your 90 Minute Art Challenge, and you could go over, you could do less, whatever you want to do. It's very, we're very uh, loose and free <laughs> with this, <laughs> you know? So. Um, I want to show a bunch of the art. Let me actually, I actually um, arranged the wrong monitor because there's so much going on today. So I apologize for a little bit of the. Uh... Yeah, Bobby, we have three different applications open to do this, right? Not, yeah. not to mention uh, the YouTube. So it's, it's, am it's actually amazing tech that we're all hooked up the way that we are. Mm -hmm. You're, that's why you're awesome, Nathan. Oh, and thank you for saving me a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Bobby, if if you go to the very first post, the, the very top one, I just po posted a little challenge on what that movie, that texture was from, the very first Instagram post. Oh, oh, okay. And the best response, the best response was that it was from Die Hard 3, which I did not work on. Uh, no, it was from Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. So that was the, the little challenge from today. Oh, oh, cool! That is on really uh, on there on my Instagram account. And that at that time was that still um, traditional? It was, yeah, painted in acrylics. Fantastic! Wow, it's uh, beautiful. So gonna... In fact, uh, when I moved uh, when I moved to the my new place that I am now, I opened up a box, and when we switched from traditional to digital, DreamWorks gave me all their acrylics, like tons of acrylics. And I still have my acrylic 
big tall jars of acrylic paints from the Prince of Egypt uh, actually still have they're still good uh, they still work so wow that's awesome nothing's better than free art supplies right <laughs> So I'm just going to go through very quickly a few highlights of the amazing art that people were doing from the 90 minute art challenge from um, previous challenges. And this one starting off with Bright Aqua from Ghana. And uh, of course, he is an accomplished uh, illustrator as well as a former guest on the 90 minute art challenge. And then this one over here, we did profiles the other day. That was really fun. That was on Monday. A ton, just a ton of really great profile. Oh, shoot. I, I did not notice that those were ours. I was just like, those look good. <laughs> I'll show those. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. That was really cool. And oops, let's go back to the stream here. Okay, so at this point now. Oh, sorry, Bobby. Um, oh, yes. Nathan and I can't see what you're seeing. Oh, I'm so sorry. No worries. I, I, I see it on YouTube, but of ah, course there there's like something like a 10 second delay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, yeah. you, you see now it now? Now we got it. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, also, just to just to mention, if you want to sketch with us, if you want to sketch with the group live, uh, you could go to where it says Discord. You could go to bit.ly slash LBX Discord, and you can join in on the Discord uh, group because um, we're always painting in Discord. <clears throat> and Discord people, you're in Discord. You're in the LBX Discord. You found your way. So feel free to join in on the conversations that we're going to have with uh, Nathan uh, today, OK? Yeah, thanks, guys. I see a bunch of you in there. Thanks for joining up. Thank you. It's going to be exciting. Now, Nathan, I got the first little question for you. Um, you yeah. know, right now we're doing thumbnails. Do you have any kind of tips or uh, perhaps rules, unspoken rules that you go by when you're doing your thumbnails? Like only using a certain amount of tones or lines first before shapes? I don't know. Yeah, you know, I call it my foundational five. I'm always talking about it in my uh, in my schoolism class. Is, you know, where it, it's a very uh, picture making is really really hard. It, it it will never be easy. But and now this isn't a formula. I don't want people to treat it as if it is. But most pictures, the foundation that they're made of is value. You know, meaning the lights and darks, uh, shape design, edge design the design of color hue and color saturation. So if you get those five things working well, give each one of them a careful consideration. And uh, you start a course, like what's the purpose of the comp? Like what's the emotion of it? What's the, what's the one primary aspect? And then design your value, your shape, your edges, your color hue, color saturation towards that sense of purpose. You've got a good shot at getting something that's working well for you. I try to really think about um, some of your artists' workouts that you have on Schoolism and thinking about the uh, three tone, mm. you just using the three tones to try to do as much as you could. That's what I had in my head as I was doing these uh, thumbnails. I just wasn't super strict on it. I'm, I'm actually glad you weren't super strict about it. This is something that, that you're aware of, Bobby, but um, I, I make a, an important distinction about that three-value study. Uh, one of the most valuable practices I'm aware of is doing three-value practice studies. And here's the reason, I think. Uh, it's not so hard to figure out what to do with the darks. You know, we can figure that out. It's not so hard to figure out what to do with the lights. But what do you do with that middle value? Is it light? Is it dark? What is it? How do you use it? So you have to think very carefully, you know, make very careful decisions. You can't just wing it. And you learn so much by going through the pain of doing that. But I don't really recommend it like for professional work or for actual work. 
um, it's just it's too hard. It's too limiting. So if you there's no rule about, you know, using limited values or four values. But if someone wants to really limit their values for like professional work or, or real work, I recommend thinking in terms of maybe four values. I also had a question about and hey, Discord people, feel free to come in at any time after this question, because uh, I'd love to ask you about hard body kind of stuff, uh, more like man-made things, human-made things uh, with very accurate angles and, you know, that kind of stuff versus organic landscapes. Um, I just kind of want to pick your brain about like, what are the skills or things that you need to concentrate on a lot more when it, it when it's dealing with uh, buildings with hard body surfaces that kind of stuff does that make sense like industrially made things buildings yeah there's uh, there there's a real thing to that uh i i like to think even more about value in terms of a hard edge cityscape because you're right it's a different animal than doing a landscape that has possibly the softness you know and the the fluffy foliage and such uh so in, in a landscape, uh, a cityscape or an industrial scape, I think you have to be even more conscientious about value because hard edges draw our attention. And one thing we might say about composition or picture making, it's very much about contrast because our eyes look at contrast. So you got to design where the contrast is and, and why and what kind it is, because that's where people are going to look. So you put it where you want people to primarily focus on and subdue it where you don't. And so these hard edge buildings are automatically going to command a lot of attention. And if you just kind of fuzz or cheat the edges, well, you can do that to an extent, but it'll look false if you overdo it. So what you do is you've got to adjust the value next to the hard edge. You really want people to pay attention to that building. Go ahead and give it a good value contrast. Maybe it's set against the sky and it really draws our attention. But if you don't want people, if it's a distraction, then find a way to group the values, the building and then what's right next to it. Make the value similar. You can keep the hard edge and keep the good hard industrial scape, but it still will be designed so that you have an appropriate contrast. Because, uh, you know, I said it a moment ago, uh, images have purpose and we have to design for that purpose. And so those value relationships will do it for you. Awesome. I, I love that. I'm going to take that and apply it to my next building or interior uh yeah fantastic i'd love to open up the floor with uh you know to any of the discord people that want to may want to join in yeah jump in uh hi <laughs> uh i'm trisha uh gartier um just wanted to to say like i'm just noticing right now we're not doing like a direct copy right more of a uh, interpretation of your work right now for yeah i think it's whatever you want it to be <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um, oh i was trying to do like a direct copy before and those colors are everywhere you know it's a real challenge like where are those edges and uh even in your shadows you have so many colors uh it's beautiful mm -hmm. uh, if if you'd like me to give a suggestion about that i i definitely can because there is something I think about. Uh, the scene, it's a very muted scene in many ways. You know, it's kind of uh, uh, somewhat of a monochromatic cool image. But uh, I, I'm always interested in having, pulling visual interest out of the color uh, as much as is appropriate to do. Some images should be very muted and monochromatic, but I often like to give it a little extra. So instead of having a gray or a monochromatic color, what I like to do is break that color into several colors. So uh, maybe there's like a cool blue gray. Well, instead of just a cool blue gray, I like to have a cool gray purple and a cool cyan and a, uh, a kind of a cool gray cyan and a cool gray, kind of an ultramarine, meaning kind of a purplish blue, like a gray purplish blue. And they're all about the same value. 
So it still feels like a blue gray monochromatic painting, but it has the subtle variations in it to give it a little bit more life. And nature does do that, you know, rocks and nature. There are all those shimmering subtle colors in nature. And that's a way that you can give that impression. That makes so much sense. Uh, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, really helpful. And I was really lucky with this particular piece. Oh, I'll just throw this out and then uh, grab the next question. I was really lucky in this particular painting because in a story moment, the humans, it's, uh, it, it's set in Southeast Asia, elephants and humans and, and uh, having to, to figure things out. But uh, the humans are in this nook with the fire but then these elephants come wandering out of the mist. They want to kind of bathe. It's like very early morning before the sun rises. And they want to bathe in the uh, waterfall. And so they come lumbering out of the mist. And the humans abandon the fire, you know, to be safe. And so it was very lucky that fire, you see the suggestion, there's a, a little kind of embers of a fire going on the right-hand side of the painting. And uh, not only was that a good balancing ele uh, element against the elephants on the other side, it gave a nice warm accent into the cool. So I really lucked out in getting a little bit of warm to play against the cools in that particular painting. That was a fun little element to um, try to figure out how do we use that and incorporate it into like a different idea, uh, as you can yeah. see on the little thumbnails. Also, before we get a little bit too far, I want to make sure that everybody knows about Schoolism and Nathan's amazing courses on Schoolism. All you need to do is go to schoolism.com. You could go to courses or you could go to instructors. There's so many different ways, but if you like, you could go to instructors and then go to Nathan, Nathan Fowkes here and uh, under his profile, you can see all the various uh, courses that Nathan teaches. So designing with light and color, environment design, pictorial composition, landscape sketching in watercolor and gouache, drawing portraits and charcoal, color and light workout, which I actually would recommend. It goes so well with the designing with light and color course. Um, and then the digital landscape painting workout, which also, I really feel like it goes with any one of these. Um, was there anything that you might want to mention about these courses at all? Like one of the most common questions, I don't know if there's an answer, but which one would you recommend to start with? Yeah, people ask that a lot. And um, there is not a recommended order. And there's actually a reason for that. You know, uh, for all of us, who uh, are concept artists and want to be concept artists, uh, there are four primary skills that you just, you have to have a real mastery of. And it's the reason I teach the particular classes I teach because we have to be experts at color and light design. We have to be experts, you know, every, just about every image we create is in a setting of some kind. So we've got to be experts at environment design. We work in pictures, and so we have to be experts at picture composition. So I teach those three classes as kind of my core, uh, core classes um, uh, because they're so central, and there's no particular order. The fourth thing that we have to be experts at, you know, uh, character, people, we have to be really good at that. Now, I'm not a character designer. I do paint characters into most of my paintings. But, uh, you know, we, we have superstars at Schoolism teaching character design, people at Pixar and many of the other studios. So those four skills we have to be experts at. And then, you know, my other classes are kind of follow up and foundation to that. Uh, 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 life drawing, uh, landscape sketching, and then the follow-up color and light workout and the uh, landscape, uh, digital landscape painting workout. Awesome. Um, and if anybody is kind of wondering, which course should I start off with? I actually recommend starting off with a Schoolism subscription because then you get access to all the courses, all of Nathan's courses, as well as every course on Schoolism. So you can really check out each one to see where do you want to start. The most important hey, thing- uh, They are, the they are very reasonably priced, so. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, I think the most important thing, though, is to stick with one. Don't go shopping around too much and not stick <laughs> with one. Hey, Bobby? Yes. If you don't mind, uh, first of all, I'd like to say hi to you and Miss A. Thank you for uh, the portrait as well, the, uh, the profiles there. It's TC. Oh, right on. Hey, TC. <laughs> that Thank was fun. You. That was really fun. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. It was a good court, uh, good lesson. If I could just take this moment to uh, to segue from what you guys were talking about with the schoolism courses, I'm in the middle, well, not the middle, the beginning, lesson four with uh, Nathan on designing with color and light. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you to Nathan. I didn't know when else I'd get an opportunity, but his course has forced me to look at things completely different than what I ever have before. I just basically, I'm a, I kind of look at character concepts. So looking at light for design is, uh, it's been a challenge, but it's been, uh, it's been, uh, pivotal the way that it's changed my thinking. So I'd, I highly recommend I it. I really appreciate that. Thank you very yeah. much. And even with the, uh, you know, I wish I could have gotten the, uh, the full course where I could have actually work with you and have the paint overs, but watching your video feedbacks. I found I've learned more through that than even through your lessons, like watching you paint over. I highly recommend anyone that's doing the courses to watch all of the video feedbacks, because that's where I'm really uh, taking away a lot from what you have to offer. So thank you. Thanks, TC. Yeah. I, one thing I really appreciate about the way schoolism structures that even if you go with the in a, inexpensive subscription rather than working directly with me, you get to see all of the feedback that students got in the courses uh, who were taking the, uh, the feedback version. So it's, it's all there. There's a lot. Yeah, the thing I love about it is like so many people will ask questions um, that totally pertain to me, but I just didn't realize it. You know what I mean? Like until they actually asked it, and I was like, it's like an iPhone. When I saw the iPhone, I was like, oh, I didn't know I needed this you know, when it first came out. That's how it kind of feels. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm having problems or if I get stuck on something, I'll watch one of your feedbacks and miraculously, you know, it's answering my questions and it's taking me down a whole nother path that I hadn't even thought mm -hmm. of. And it, it's really good. Fantastic. Thanks. And you can see here, Nathan, now we're starting to paint together and we're trying to figure out how to paint a oh, cohesive right. painting. <laughs> it was really fun. Very challenging. It, you guys are like twins that just, just work, uh, work hand in hand there. That's fantastic. Yeah, we just spent the first, uh, I forget, like 10, 15 minutes doing thumbnails. Yeah. And then we discussed them, picked the thumbnail, and then uh, enlarged the thumbnail. Right. And just started painting. We already have a color concept, you know, because of your painting. So, yeah. I just had a question for Nathan. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah go right ahead. Um, how is your eye doing and are you going to miss wearing an eye patch? <laughs> well, I might not have <laughs> to miss wearing the eye patch. Thank you very much for, for asking. Yeah, I see that uh, in in the uh, we've we've got a little icon on my webcam up, uh, so people see that I'm wearing an eye patch. Yeah, you can go. It, it last year was quite a year, uh, and if there it, is, it's a story that actually goes pretty deep. Uh, so I did it as a talk for Lightbox Expo last year, or I guess it was the year before, um, uh, because we we talked about I, I called it the bulletproof freelance. Career for difficulties because uh, medically I was down for uh, for quite a while and so I talked about your freelance career so that um, you can weather the things that inevitably happen to all of us that's uh, lightboxexpo.com I also have it up on my YouTube page, linked on my YouTube page as well uh, so I'm only going on and on about this I know no one you know no one uh, no one cares so much, you know, about my my medical backstory, but um, we do care about having a freelance career that that weathers the storm. And so uh, uh, I went through quite a situation, but um, uh, recovered better than they 
thought that I would from this particular situation. I'm completely back to 100% from that, except that I have to wear this eye patch. So they did, uh, we were able, I have double vision as a result of, of this, uh, this medical procedure. Uh, and so my eyesight is great. I do have double vision, so I wear an eye patch because, you know, I'll bump into things or I'll reach for the wrong object, you know, I'll reach for the wrong of the two images, I'll reach for the wrong one. Uh, but only need one eye to be a 2D artist. It makes absolutely no difference. Uh, in fact, I'm constantly squinting one eye shut to see my subject in 2D so I can paint in 2D because our images are 2D, not 3D. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the parallax that our two eyes see. So I have been fitted with these like hyper prism glasses and I do, I use them for driving. I can drive without the eye patch on, but everything ebbs and everything stretches and flows so much that they make me violently motion sick. Mm -hmm. And they're very painful to wear because there are lots of eye strain. What that means is you guys are probably going to see me in an eye patch for several years to come. So I don't mind. I hope you guys don't mind. I really appreciate you guys asking, and, and that's the backstory about mm -hmm. the eye patch. Well, you got a good shape head. If that was me, I don't know. The back of my head is like <laughs> flat. You, know? you got to have a good shape head to wear the eye patch and rock it well, and you do. Yeah. Oh, thank It'll you. It'll be iconic <laughs> as well. Totally. I don't know any other artist with an eye patch. Totally. Oh, and one, uh, if you guys don't mind me, there's something just funny. Uh, it, it's actually, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm fine with the whole situation. I'm actually, I'm doing great. But um, people, it's no secret to people who have followed along or my students, I have a real gripe about uh, chromatic aberration in, in artwork. Now, I'm in favor of it. It's a tool. Chromatic aberration is that thing where through a lens, you know, the, there's like a red rim on one side and a, a cyan rim on the other side. Mm -hmm. And that's a real thing that lenses do, especially cheap or very thick lenses. And uh, it, it became a thing, you know, a decade ago, and it's been used quite well for kind of sci-fi or certain kind of scenarios where they put that chromatic aberration in their paintings or even some movies, a Spider-Man did it. And so it can be a very effective thing but people were throwing that into every single image, in my opinion, you know, like not to the best effect. Started kind of uh, speaking out about how, hey, it's one option, but there are other ways to get really good color vibrance that are actually more effective than doing that in many circumstances. I bring this up because these, you know, very expensive hyper prism glasses that I got, guess what? Chromatic aberration. Everything that I see through those things has super chromatic aberration. Everything has a red and a blue rim. Oh my so those of you who saw my very, I, I did a very grouchy YouTube video about it. I, I, I mean, I tried to be helpful. The YouTube's all about good ideas for color vibrance, that, but also other options. But, you know, it was a bit of a rant. And so all of you who got, you know, like irritated at me for the rant, you can just laugh hysterically because everything I see through those glasses, chromatic aberration. That's so ironic. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I want to segue somehow into exchangelings, but I don't know how, so I'm just going to pop it up. We're doing a fun uh, Discord challenge um, called Fairy Exchangelings with the number one fairy artist out there, Iris Compete. Uh, and Masay and I and Iris, we're all going to be doing traditional paintings for that one a traditional 90 minute workout for that one and if you join us and you also do something traditional you can find all the details in uh discord lbx discord or uh you know social media and such then you have an opportunity to win an original painting from either iris Massey, or myself and it's going to be a random draw. So if you're just starting off as a painter, as an artist, whatever, you have the uh, equal amount of uh, chance to win as well. Okay, so it's really about just painting and drawing. 
it's not about the competition. It's about us yeah. all coming together and just doing what we do, which is art. It's a good excuse to. Iris is, yeah, I'm excited about that. Uh, Iris mm -hmm. is fantastic, so that's going to be great. Yeah. It'll be fun. Mm hmm. Um, we also have some questions from Slido. So if you have questions and you don't want to join the Discord thing or you didn't know what Discord is or, you know, I didn't know last year pretty much. I kind of knew. Um, but yeah, if you would rather just type in a question through Slido, you could go to slido.com, hashtag 90Mac, okay, 90Mac, 90 90min 90 Art Challenge, and you could type in your question there. We have a question from um uh, anonymous so this one says i feel like i've reached a plateau in my artistic progress and stopped leveling up do you have advice how to push forward yeah you know uh two two things uh one thing uh this is no secret to my students because it's something i go on and on about, you know, probably to the point where, yeah, Nathan, we got it. We heard you the first time, uh, you know, but it's, it's so critical because way back when I was starting, I, I, I got out of art school. I, I was working professionally and that was fantastic, but I knew I had so much further to go. And but, you know, working long hours and really exhausted. So what I felt like I had in me was I could at least find an hour a day to do some kind of a practice study. To, so some some new ideas new was coming in every single day, and uh, it came from uh, three places. It was uh, uh, sketching from life, of course. You know, you got to go to the source and sketch and paint from life. Sketching from masters, and by masters, I just mean any image that you admire that you feel you could learn something from. And then the third, of course, is sketching from imagination to kind of bring those ideas back out and make your own. And uh, so I did that, and I made a point to do that every day. And it was so incredibly helpful that I made a commitment, hey, I'm, I'm always going to do this. I'm always going to make sure uh, I'm drawing in new ideas and then turning them around and creating new ideas. And so in the, that was like, I don't know, mid nineties, 1995. And uh, I, I've almost never missed a day in, uh, oh my gosh, is that 26 years? Really? Uh, so uh, I, I strongly recommend that, but I also recommend, you know, uh, kind of fall back. It, it, it's easy. We, we get into a rut where we just don't feel particularly inspired. And, uh, and that's a very difficult thing to deal with. Another thing that I've done that's been really helpful, and it's a little bit less related to art, but rather getting into that kind of creative mindset. Uh, whenever uh, I have an experience where I feel really inspired or just really that that sense of flow that really lifted up. I think back back to the 90s, I went to this Earth, Wind and Fire concert. If you guys don't mind a little aside, I love that band, Earth, Wind and Fire. But I, I went to this concert, it was in Las Vegas, and you could tell that there were a bunch of people that got dra drugged. You know, half the people wanted to be there. And the other half, you could see on their faces, they got drug out you know by their spouse their you know their their partner to this thing and so i thought oh man these concerts are only fun if the audience is really in and there are a bunch of stony faced people at this las vegas you know kind of dinner theater concert with earth wind and fire well this band is so good they had all of these people on their feet and just out of their minds with excitement you know by the halfway point of the show and, uh, you know, I love the music so much. I felt the same way. It's just this effervescent uh, that, that music and a, a musical concert really gives you. And so, and no, like that was so, I, I was so lifted up by that, that when I needed to get myself kind of in the zone, I just kind of took myself back to that feeling. And then I was excited to do something, you know, really excited to get out there, put something out, create something that I hoped other people would get excited about. So I have this journal. Anytime I have something like that happen that I get really excited about, I write it down and then I thumb through it and I take myself back to those moments and kind of relive it. And then I feel creative. I, I feel at least in the mood 
to do something where, you know, five minutes before I felt kind of, uh, you know, I'm tired. I don't quite feel right. I'm feeling kind of off. I didn't get enough sleep. I don't really feel enthusiastic. Snap myself back to it. So that has been very helpful. Is that kind of like an, like an idea sketchbook of like things that you could do, uh, fun ideas that you might want to pursue later? Yeah, I have both. So I'm a, I have a trillion sketchbooks laying around and uh, some of them are from life sketchbooks. Some of them are idea sketchbooks. And this one is literally a journal where I just write a sentence or two about, about a particular event. So I don't forget it. I don't lose it because mm -hmm. like I say, going back to it means a lot. Uh, so I have all kinds of material that I've, uh, you know, sketched out or written over the years that I can fall back on. Ah, I love I that idea. Yeah, I have a full. By the way, of... yep. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bobby. Uh, I was going to say I have a folder in my computer for sketches of ideas that I might want to do later. Mm -hmm. Hey. You know, if uh, if the audience out there doesn't mind a little story about the value of sketchbooks, and I I, I mentioned this in in a couple of my classes as well. Um, uh, we we all love uh, you know Wallace and Gromit and uh, and uh, oh why isn't the name of the studio popping into my head all of a sudden? Ardman. Uh, what's the studio that uh, Ardman? Of course, of course. I just you know uh, I guess I didn't get enough sleep last night, but uh, yeah. So Ardman Studios. Uh, uh, so DreamWorks contacted Ardman. You know they had done Wallace and Gromit. They'd done a bunch of fantastic stuff, and DreamWorks was interested in partnering with Ardman. So, you know, Jeffrey Katzenberg called up Nick Park, the creative guy behind Ardman and the, the creator of Wallman. If you haven't seen those, they've been around for a long time. They're fantastic. But uh, Jeffrey, hey, you know, we're uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg from DreamWorks. Hey, you know, Nick, great to talk to you. And, you know, we're interested in a partnership and, and we're wondering, you know, do you guys have any movie ideas we're interested in uh, in working with you. And so Nick, you know, uh, being a smart guy and kind of playing the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have lots of movie. We have lots of movie ideas. We've been kicking around this and that. Let me kind of put some things together and we can show you or talk to you about, you know, our, our movie ideas. So Katzenberg. Oh, great. Fantastic. You know, we'll 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 ha we'll make we'll set up a meeting. And so, and this is, comes from Nick Park. He gave a talk. He said, I, I'm going to admit to you guys. He gave us a talk at DreamWorks. He said, I'm going to admit to you guys the story behind our collaboration with you. He said, I got off the phone and, you know, I was totally lying. I didn't have any movie ideas. I was a short, you know, I was a short story guy. So like in a panic, he started going through his old books just looking for something that could be a movie idea and he had this little thumbnail he said there was this little cartoon i literally drew it i was talking on the phone and just doodling in a sketchbook because i keep a sketchbook by the phone and, and just like to do that and it was of a chicken trying to scratch its way dig its way out from under a, a chicken coop fence that's all it was <laughs> And if you guys ever saw, I guess it's way back, something like 15 years ago now, but we did the movie Chicken Run. It was a really fun movie. It did well. It made, uh, back at that time, it made, I think, well over $100 million. And so for what it was and for the time, it was very successful, fun show. And this in movie, you know, 90 minute movie collaboration with Ardman and DreamWorks called Chicken Run. It all came out of this little doodle that he'd done in a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't done that doodle, well, we would have st still done a movie with them. Maybe it would have been great, but that little thing became, you know, a hundred million dollar project. So the moral of the story is if you want a hundred million dollar project, keep a sketchbook by your phone and keep that mm -hmm. thing burning all the time. But I don't want to be a pie. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, that's from the movie? Oh, okay. Oh, gotcha now. I, I, yeah, chicken pie. Thank you. Yeah, you, you confused me for a second, but that was a very good comment. Yeah, chicken, chicken, chicken pot pie, right? I yeah. want to mention something real quick. Um, uh, Jamie was mentioning to me, hey, mention that uh, Cody Gramstad is going to be doing an Instagram takeover on Monday. 
So Monday, we're going to be streaming with Cody uh, in you know, LBX Discord. And then afterwards, I believe around 12 uh, p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, he'll be, doing, he'll be taking over the, um, the Lightbox Expo. Is it, yeah, it's the Lightbox Expo Discord, right? Or is it Schoolism? No, it's Schoolism. Sorry. Schoolism Live's uh, <laughs> Instagram account. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to say I totally agree with what Nathan said about you know having a sketchbook because the little do- doodles can go a long way. Like even the the painting that's in my background, that was an idea that I came up with um, two or three years ago, and then I finally fleshed it out just you know last year in winter time, and I think um, like. Every every time you do, uh, draw in your sketchbook, I feel like um, everyone's always in a different state of mind, different situation, and then just putting that down on paper. And you know, when your future self looks at it, it's like you also look at it at a different perspective as well. And then that could like grow a whole you know entire story from it. So I yeah, sketchbooks are just you know they're they're gold. They're they're like a treasure chest full of ideas. And it's a fantastic painting. Yeah, I was happy to see that be the theme of the uh, winter <laughs> sale. Thank you. Right on. And would anybody else like to uh, chime in and join in on the conversation here? And while they're thinking about it, your painting's coming along nicely here for the Magma Studio uh, challenge. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so... Massey's <laughs> painting on the right side. I'm painting on the left side. Um, and what was the idea again, Massey? Um, Bobby, you, I think this is your thumbnail drawing in the middle, but you're the one who came up with the story of uh, there's like a tribe in the foreground and they see this like mysterious fire lady in the distance. And uh, I think as we were talking, we were just saying like, oh, what if the tribe was like, you know, made out of like wood and you know all this like dry stuff because they're from the forest and um like what they're seeing is this like beautiful magical thing but then they're it's actually you know not good for them so that was kind of like the story behind our little painting yeah yeah it's like icarus flying to the sun right it's kind of like an icarus type story (laughs) the the fire and the dry wood that's Mm -hmm. that's good yeah like the like the contrast to that being in the schoolism kind of makes me feel like Icarus. Uh, and the question I was going to ask is, how do you know how quickly you should be making progress? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's a great question because um, uh, pr- that can be incredibly distressing because I think about how we naturally learn things. My experience, and I think most people, it's definitely true of my schoolism students and me coming up, uh, you you are trying to learn a new skill. Maybe you can do some things modestly well and rightly proud of that, but you want to bring new skills into that. What inevitably happens is as you start learning the new skill and focusing on how to do that thing better, you actually get much worse. And the reason for that is you're no longer able to hold on to all the things you already know and do as you're focusing on this new thing. I always use uh, the uh, metaphor of juggling. Like you might get good at juggling three balls. You, you can do it you know, without even thinking. Your hands and your eyes just know what to do. But when you introduce a fourth ball into it, say, hey, you know, I want to do even more and better. You introduce a fourth ball and instantly where you could juggle perfectly a moment before, now all the balls are constantly on the floor. You just cannot do anything right. But if you keep at it, you gradually, you know, you you just kind of train yourself and you get better and then you go way down. But when you make your way back up, you're so much better than before. And so, you know, you introduce that new skill, fight through it, introduce the new skill, fight through it. And so you're constantly on this roller coaster ride. Uh, It's an upward trajectory overall. But if you focus on the valleys, they feel very low. That's a really good metaphor, by the way. (laughs) Yes, thank you so much. That really inspired me to just take my time and make my progress slowly. 
Absolutely. I just noticed that um, one of the guests in one of the future streams it has joined us in the Discord, in the LBX Discord. Everybody say hello to Iris Muddy. Hey, Iris. Hey, Iris. Hey, Iris. Hey, Iris. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just wanted to give her a little Iris. shout out. Um, so, yeah, let's go on to another question while we have Nathan here for this very special opportunity. Uh, Anonymous, this is another one from Anonymous. Nathan, do you do drawing studies or practices too? If yes, how do you do them? Now, we talked about sketchbooks quite a lot. Is there any other kind of practices or specific practices that might not be as common? Uh, well, that's a good question. Not, not as common. I, I do. One thing, um, one thing I've been fanatical about is getting my life drawing in. And I actually sat down, uh, so I did it so that I could brag to my students, you know, go on and on and, and, uh, and, and brag about this. But, hey, it's my job. When, when you're teaching a class, it is your job to be a positive example. So at least it's legitimate on that level. But um, I estimate that I've done about 20,000 hours of life drawing, you know, sketching people. And most of that, a lot of that, uh, and that's not including landscape painting, but uh, in the life drawing classroom. Wow. Uh, starting in art school, you know, I was a fanatic about it and uh, never missed, you know, uh, in art school. Every afternoon they had uh, open life drawing. You know, it's not a taught class, but just you go in and there's life drawing for three hours. And I made a point to never miss that. And then I continued to do it. I, I would go to local art schools that had open life drawing sessions and made sure I went at least twice a week. And then luckily DreamWorks always had uh, two to three life drawing and painting sessions every week, like at lunch. Uh, we had like lunch on Wednesdays for an hour and we had three hour sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays or two, I think it's Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but anyway. Uh, and so uh, what all of you should be saying, as much as I'm saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm bragging about how dedicated I am. What you all should be saying right now is, well, geez, Nathan, you know, you did 20,000 hours. You should be a lot better than you are, which may well be true. But um, you don't have to worry about if you have any talent. I really don't think uh, I, you have to worry about if you have uh, serious dedication, you know, dedication that takes you almost almost into an obsessive realm uh, because it's just necessary to learn how the world works and then to how to reproduce the world and your thoughts and your ideas onto a two-dimensional page canvas screen. It's just absolutely necessary. And, you know, we're all, uh, life drawing isn't happening so much right now because of the current environment, but there's so many resources online. You know, we have our schoolism classes, but there's also uh, web pages dedicated to references. You know, you can get a subscription or download life drawing references and just look at your screen and draw. Sit in front of your computer, listen to some music, have a fantastic time with it. Do it, you know, uh, two, three times a week. Uh, get those references and and just just enjoy it. I don't listen to audiobooks if it isn't too distracting for you. And uh, I know twenty thousand hours sounds like a lot, but if you do it over the course of three years and do it uh, twice a week, those hours add up very fast. Fantastic. So even hours of bad art practice still count. Because sometimes it, it's hard to say if doing bad work counts. Counts less. It does. <laughs> uh, well, here, here's how you make it count. Uh, so I, I, one, one thing I'm, I'm bugging my students about, like sometimes a student will say, oh, you know, I did, here's my, you know, here's my studies for this assignment. I did more, but they just were a disaster, so I didn't include them. I say, no, you know, put them in there for crying out loud. You know, 
figure out why they went wrong so that never happens again and i know it's, it's a little embarrassing you know um because the other students it's a virtual classroom other students see your work and i know that people feel a little embarrassed to show horrible you know what they feel like was a disaster but we've got to do it so that we can figure out why did it go wrong and what's the solution so next time that problem comes up you have a solution and that's critically important and one bit of good news about that more often than not it's only because they didn't know the next step to take to make it work and often it's one little idea that takes something that's very bad and just snaps it into place and uh and and so often it's a revelation for people and so i recommend that so here's the thing uh so i know you know you're you're part serious and and a little tongue-in-cheek about all the bad drawings and paintings we end up doing it's true we do but here's another thing uh, uh I, I, my claim is i got nothing my only claim is that i am dedicated that's one thing i'll say about myself you know uh, almost uh, almost to an obsessive level so uh, every bad drawing, painting, and sketch that I do, I do not let it lie. I do not put it away. I don't hide it. I don't throw away. And I literally, this is another obsessive thing. I mean, like without ex exception, I'm not exaggerating. You go to a life drawing session and you do a whole bunch, you know, you do kind of the 30 minute warm ups and you do five minute poses and 10 minute. I look at those after the session was over and every single one of them that isn't working, I figure out why. Oh, I could have just put a background against this and then it would have read, you know, just put a dark against my figure. All of a sudden it pops into place. I concentrated on the anatomy instead of the one line of thrust that makes that arm work. Let me push that line of thrust in there and then let the anatomy work with that one line oh that was the solution you know a, a landscape painting did a landscape painting it was horrible it was a disaster out on location it just fell apart take a couple photos on location come back to the studio figure out why it didn't work paint over top of it and i do not let one single failure pass without figuring out why it didn't work i want to strongly recommend that because that of the experience i've gained it's doing was about 60 percent of it but the other 40 percent solving the failures and so let me make that recommendation that is very true can i add something i don't throw out though? anything and draw can I just throw add, in Bobby? Yeah, because okay, first you went to Art Center, correct? I did. Yeah. And so Art Center, most likely you would have gotten better instruction than if you were in some no name little school in, you know, Zimbabwe, perhaps. Right? I almost yeah. guarantee it. Um and the students that you refer to in your class have you as an instructor. Uh so I just wanted to kind of mentioned there could be a scenario where there's a beginner artist they have no instruction they have no good instruction and they're trying to draw mm -hmm. and they keep doing these bad drawings right um in the other scenarios it's like people have good instruction it's just they're doing bad drawings uh so having good instruction is the difference between between doing exercise that you had you had no instructions on how to do exercise and you're trying to get fit and you're flailing your arms around like phoebe and friends and running down the street if you remember that episode she might get a little fit but if you learn from like usain bolt or something on how to run then you're going to get way better way faster you might have some bad runs in the beginning but that's okay because you got the good instruction yeah. Right? I'm, I'm on yeah, board for the schoolism true. train. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, appreciate the schoolism mention. But there, you know, there is, there's, there's so much out there. You know, choose carefully because um, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Not, not all of it, you know, uh, is, is helpful or applicable to everyone or every situation. But this is the best time to be an artist. One is there's so much opportunity. 
you know, everything in, in the made world was designed by somebody, you know, and it's a world filled with pictures and imagery that we live in. But also there's so much instruction out there. And if you if you search hard and work hard, even if you're on a super tight budget, you know, we, of course, the schoolism, we, we work for, set it up for those people. But even so, there's so much out there that, that you can draw uh, uh, ideas from. But let me also encourage people, you know, I want everyone to get on YouTube and watch everybody's videos and, and all the artists out there giving tips and, and such. I, I have gotten a little frustrated uh, about the, um, uh, uh, about the, the kind of, it's, it's almost kind of the, the fracking approach, the strip mining approach to YouTube. You know, you go through as quickly as you can and grab the the brush packs, the the, the little technique, you know, quick techniques, quick ideas. Um, uh, and you're kind of very tool and technique oriented and you just kind of strip mine as fast as you can all of the free videos all over YouTube and get a whole bunch of cool techniques and brushes and such and, and run with that. That's not bad. It's not wrong. And I'm in favor of doing that. But you also have to go deeper. Tools and techniques have to always be driven by principles about foundational ideas. So you just got to make sure those of you who are at the beginning of a learning curve, think about what foundation because the artists that I, you know, that I've worked with at some of the studios, it doesn't, we're painting in acrylics, we're painting in gouache, we're painting in Photoshop, we're using some weird, you know, doing some stuff, uh, doing stuff in, in Renderman and, and in Nuke and in Houdini. You know, these people, if the tool can make a full range of color and value, then they can make an amazing picture. Doesn't matter what the tool is, doesn't matter what the technique is. But the people who strip mine YouTube for quick, amazing techniques cannot do that. And they'll get very quickly left behind. So that's my recommendation. Can I ask you a question about obsession? You know, because- like <laughs> Yeah, please. Please I'm a do. person. I think I already know what my answer is, but go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm a person that can get very obsessive as well. And I think that's pretty much a, a trait that a lot of maybe successful people have is being able to be obsessive. And I do remember a point in my learning, you know, as a student thinking, uh, is it dangerous to get too obsessive? Am I going to get too obsessive if I really dive in and give it my all? Um, kind of thinking to my parents saying, hey, artists, when they get too obsessive, they go crazy and they start cutting off their ears. I don't know about art, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever gotten to a point where you were too obsessive, Nathan? I, I really appreciate that question. I've been thinking, I've thought a lot about that over the last several years because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very happily married guy. I have a family. I have three kids. And obviously, that's an important focus. You know, um, the, these little kids, I'm staying the obvious. Everyone knows, hey, you have, you know, it's, it's nothing special to me. Everyone knows, hey, you have kids. They literally die without you. If you're not there, you know, you're the difference between this little helpless baby's born and you're the difference between life and death. They literally will die without your attention. And, you know, these, these little people I'm completely responsible for. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, an obsession with work can really affect that. And so I, I, there's two things I want to say about this. One is, you know, we, uh, uh, my opinion is most of us can do two things well. You know, in our, we, there's enough time, any average person, you know, and, and, and average, an average human can do some pretty remarkable things. So my opinion is any average person can do two things really well, but you have to be willing to let go of most everything else. Well, hey, I'm a family man. I love it. I always wanted to be a dad. That's, you know, that's my thing. And so uh, I do that. That's my, my social life is my family and the little outings that we go on. And then the rest of my time, you know, this artistic obsession. Um, I'm also lately, I got a little bit into gardening. You know, there's some time for small hobbies, but there's not time for a third huge thing. So 
uh, the definition, I, I think, of kind of the, the good life and being an obsessive person like we are is understanding that sacrifice means giving up a lot of good things so that you can gain something even better. And we have to be willing to do that. But Bobby, you're talking a little about, a bit about the dark side of how our lives can go horribly, horribly wrong mm -hmm. because of this great thing uh, of being an artist, right? And uh, I, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Because, uh, you know, like I say, I have thought a lot about balancing my time over the last many years. So when you're hyper focused on something, that's good. It means you're going to do it really well, obviously. But when you're focused and you have those blinders on, that means there's a whole lot of things that you are not focused on that you do not see. So what I've come to is here's what's going to happen to all of us. And this is I've come to the conclusion this is inevitable and we have to just kind of live with it. So something's going to happen to us where we are going to be completely blindsided by something in our lives because that's what we, you're focused. That means you do not see everything else. And something is going to hit you and knock you off of your feet completely. It's going to be devastating. It will happen to everybody. Uh, who is focused on their art career the way that we have been. And when it happens, we're going to say, oh my gosh, how did I let that happen? How did I not see that coming? You know, I should have taken steps to avoid that. I should have been more attentive to this other thing. I should have, should have, should have. How could have I not seen this coming? In hindsight, it's so obvious, and yet it was devastating. The thing I've come to is, there's no way around it. And that's just the nature of life. And that's just the nature of focus. And so it may be now every, uh, let me qualify this by saying everything's fine. My life is very happy. A few things like that have happened, but not to worry. Everything's fine. Everything's great. Everything's normal. You just have to, you know, you have to step back you, you probably have to straighten something out. You might have to apologize to some people that you didn't realize something about. Uh, and you have to kind of look at what you need to do to make it right. But you also need to say, that's just the nature of the life I lead. I learned a lesson. I'm going to do better. I'm going to watch out for those things now that I know. And I'm going to keep going the best that I can figure out. So for any of you people out there who have been so focused that something blindsided you that you shouldn't should have seen coming, uh, you know, by the power invested in me by absolutely nobody, you know, I hereby grant you forgiveness, you know, move on, make it right. And uh, and you're that much better because of it. OK, so how's that for a speech about uh, the hard knocks of life, Bobby? Yay, I'm forgiven. I love it. Yeah, I'm me clean too. slate. <laughs> Here's a question. Here's a quick question from John Allen in uh, Slido. Nathan, what do you do for fun? What do you do for fun, art related and non art related? Yeah, I'll tell you what I'm doing now. Uh, nobody cares, but I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you because it's the answer to the question. You know, uh, I'm. I, turned I'm 50 years old now and uh and my wife and I were were savers and we've been saving up for many years and so we bought some property we bought a house we we are literally were the last house in Los Angeles I love that our house is the last house in a neighborhood cul-de-sac and then behind us the property goes up into the canyon so it's nice because our front yard is a neighborhood and our backyard is uh, an open canyon without backyard neighbors and so we have uh, we have 10 acres of property. And so, uh, you know, I, I need exercise. I do not go to a gym. I'm sorry. I never will. You people who can walk on a treadmill, I admire you. I don't know how you can do that. I don't know. I know that you watch TV or you put on headphones. I will never be able to go to a gym. It'll never happen. But what I'm doing is I'm spending at least an hour a day. I'm gardening. I'm developing the property, landscape painting. I'm putting in about an hour, maybe even an hour and a half every single day. You know, I work from home. 
Uh, maybe it's kind of the compensation for not having a commute. And I love it. You know, I'm putting in shrubbery. We have, I'm trying to turn it into a California oasis. I'm literally trying to make it my little California oasis. We have 30 palm trees. Uh, you know, we have, I, I'm literally trying to, to, it's, I call it my California Monet garden. That's the goal. My little Monet, you know, uh, garden. So uh, you can hear me getting really excited as I tell you guys about it. So I'll, I'll stop there because I'll go on and on. You know, like, did you guys know that even in the wintertime, Black Eyed Susans will grow up your palm tree and create a floral, you know, uh, I'm about to dive into that. So that's currently, uh, it's how I get exercise, you know, and uh, and it's what I'm enjoying on the side. That, that uh, yeah, that little spiel that you're about to, that you could totally extend. It reminds me of when we went yeah. to uh, Florianopolis, Brazil together. And I forget if it was, yeah, I think it was in Florianopolis. We went to some jungly kind of area, remember, with a beautiful waterfall. And I remember that, yeah. I remember you seeing these plants that you most likely never seen before in your life and identifying them, like one after another after another. Uh, yeah, my, my dad uh, was a science teacher, college science teacher, and a geologist by training. He worked first for the United States Geological Survey, and then went in from there, got his master's and, and doctorate degree, and, and so became a college teacher. And that, that, that was fantastic, you know, geology and, and the earth sciences. I love that stuff. And so I, I do the, uh, that might be another hobby, you know, the natural sciences. I went through this phase, speaking of obsessions. So I decided, <laughs> it's, it's, you guys are going to worry about me. Like Nathan, we, we thought you were a normal guy. We're going to start to worry. Now we're worried about you. Uh, I decided that I was going to be able to name every single star in the night sky. It's not as hard as you would think. Because uh, I love astronomy, love it. You know, uh, if you look up at... Uh, if you look up at the Cygnus constellation, there's a black hole. You can't see it, of course, but there's literally a black hole right there in that Cygnus constellation. So there's only about 6,000 stars that you can see individually in the night sky. I did not memorize 6,000 stars, but I memorized all the constellations and the major stars in them. And then it's like, you know, Cygnus Alpha, Cygnus Beta, and it's very easy to name them from there. So I go through these obsessive about the natural sciences because you know nature is just it, it's it's beyond comprehension I, I listened to this talk once about how the uh, universe there may be aspects of the universe that are beyond maybe incomprehensible to the human mind but it's worth trying so I get really excited about that stuff you know to know and I'll just say one more thing and then I, I promise I'll, I'll stop but uh, my dad this was a guy, uh, so uh, you could be hiking and there'd be like a, a cliff face. And my dad, you know, to the rest of us, well, it's a cliff face and you could see layering of geologic strata, you know, and that's all the rest of us see. But my dad sees it and it's a language to him. He'll say, okay, this layer here, that's the Cretaceous age of the dinosaurs right there. And then you can see the layer, you know, the asteroid hit the earth and you can see the, the differentiation right there. That timeline stopped and then you have the next layer. And then if you see a little bit higher, that's when an ocean covered this land. And then uh, 20 million years passed and this next layer, the ocean evaporated away. And my dad can literally read a cliffside like that. You know, he could do that, you know, to know, to look at the night sky and to know what you're seeing, to look at a cliff face and to know what you're seeing. That's something that I get pretty enthusiastic about. That's so awesome. I'm so glad I brought that up. That was so cool. <laughs> yeah. That is. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm actually currently going through your uh, design of and light of light and color course, and yeah, I'm also going to art school and going to work to work myself through art school. Um, what can I do to avoid burnout by overworking myself? 
Yeah, yikes. Uh, I, I understand where you're coming from. That's, that's a tough position to be in, but a necessary position for a lot of us. You know, um, college students, and I, I don't know, uh, I don't know how, how old you are, but there's a good chance you, you kind of have the flame of youth on your, your side and, and can handle some things. Uh, but uh, there's kind of a thing in college, you kind of pride yourself, oh, I did an all-nighter, and you feel really dedicated. And uh, I, I guess sometimes you, you may have to do that and may have to lose sleep. But in hindsight, it was kind of dumb, you know, to do all nighters and to be uh, to, to, to get your rest as best you can and to, to force yourself to have at least enough stability to get the rest and get the sleep that you need rather than doing that college, you know, that that college lifestyle thing. Because looking back in hindsight, it was really uh, it was really counter productive um you know beyond that i'd have to think a little bit further uh about your questions because you are you're you're sacrificing right now in your life you're sacrificing a lot of good things uh so that you can do something even better you can have the opportunities that an artist has you know in this life and and the age that we lived in so uh, that we live in right now so hats off to you for making those sacrifices Something that really helped me, uh, maybe it might help you, it helped me through so much stuff, was just developing a quick style and a, and a more like thought out, more time consuming style. So the projects I didn't like, I did the quick style. And then I, <laughs> you know, I went back yeah. onto the things that I was more interested in. I still got good grades because it was a complete looking style, but it's just simpler. And if, if you'd like, on my YouTube page, I have a video I did for, we, we did it for Lightbox, uh, the online Lightbox we did this last year. And so it's on my YouTube channel calling get, called Getting to the Heart of Every Painting. And it's all about doing what Bobby just said, you know, finding the simple statement, kind of getting to the core of what an image is ab about and doing it economically. And one thing I, I, I really love, you know, uh, people out there and me included have a lot of love for the 1960s and 70s illustrators like Bernie Fuchs uh, was kind of the superstar of that period. There were artists like Bob Peake and, and several others. And these are people who had to turn around illustrations, all these editorial and advertising illustrations for them to make a living. They had to turn these things around fast. And so they developed a very economical style, an economical approach. And it was driven by amazing composition. And so their compositions were so engaging that uh, they were just thrilling to look at. And yet they were quick. You know, they had a graphic. There was a it was uh, it was in many ways based on design of shapes, shapes of local color and value rather than shapes of light and shadow. And this entire quick style came out of that movement. And it happened because of those demands. Uh, of timeliness on the on the artists, and uh, and so I love you know the uh, necessity is the mother of invention and all of that. Uh, uh, something really great came out of those limitations, and I think that's kind of where where you're going to live is finding that economical statement, and it'll actually has the potential of making your work much better because it's going to be straight to the point. Fantastic. Thank you. We have a quick question from a fellow schoolism instructor, uh, the awesome almighty Nikolai Lockertson. Uh, he asks, Nathan, what's your favorite medium for art? Yeah, um, I have a trick for that. It, it's, it's obvious. No, it's not a trick that no one knows about. But um, my trick is kind of gaming myself with the whole grass is always greener thing, because that's how human beings are. It doesn't matter. You know, you, you have something that you, you want 
but somehow if the thing that you don't have at that moment, you want that more than the thing that you have. That's kind of human nature. And so I kind of, I game that because I love digital painting. I love Photoshop. It's an amazing medium. I enjoy the work. But, you know, you're in front of your computer screen in a dark room for hours and you're like, oh, man, I just want to splash around. I want to get away from the screen. I want to splash around watercolor. And so I'll do it. I literally have a desk underneath my computer desk with all my watercolors on it, a table. I slide that table out from under my computer desk. I pop up reference on my computer screen and I'll do a little sketch and take a break from digital painting because I love watercolor. Just love it. I like to use white gouache with my watercolor if I need any opacity, you know, kind of the same way you might do an oil painting, just use white wherever you would with opaque painting. Uh, so I'll do that. But then inevitably, and I'll love it, but inevitably I'll think, oh man, I, I wish I could put a warm filter over my watercolor painting. I, I like it, but I wish I could add a little contrast and put a warm filter over it. It'd be better. And then I start wishing I was painting digitally and kind of get sick of the frustration of watercolor. And so then I'll be so excited to go back to the digital. And then, you know, I'll go to my charcoal and then charcoal turns into a big mess. I love charcoal, but then it's a big mess. I want to wash up and go back to the cleanliness, you know, of the digital environment. And so I love all the mediums and I play them all against each other to increase my productivity so that I'm always doing art stuff and always excited to get to it and get away from the other thing. It's awesome. Um, quick thing from Patrick Johnson. He said, Hey, Nathan, just want to say thanks for being an influence in my childhood. <clears throat> Not sure how you feel about that when a grown adults say that. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm getting that weird. more and more because <laughs> the, the movie, you know, the movie started coming out in the 90s. And some of the people, uh, you know, checking in right now, weren't even, you know, 1998 was when the Prince of Egypt came out. Oh, some of the people checking in, uh, in their late teens weren't even born so yeah i do understand that <laughs> well this person was saying <laughs> i was trained by wade huntsman in undergrad oh yeah and mm -hmm. did a lot of studies of from el dorado yeah wade and i went through art school together and then we both worked at dreamworks for several years and then he went he, he left dreamworks to uh uh to to teach at university and to do, do his own personal work along with uh being a university professor awesome but yeah i'm very happy to have uh uh, to have have influence you know for those movies to be have been memorable for people do you have um, any advice? This one comes from Anonymous. Uh, tips for portfolios for color stylists. You know, what are some of the best skills to showcase to sh show off your understanding of color? I say versatility uh, because, you know, I, I see some artists and I'm in favor of it. But there, there might be an artist, for instance, just somebody who uh, almost always does dark brooding scenes. That's their thing. And they do it amazingly well. I love that. You know, I love kind of gothic and, and uh, the, the moody and brooding stuff. But I also know that artists like that will never get hired to work on the kind of projects that I work on because these stories require an incredible range. Now, I'm not a person who naturally has an incredible range. You know, it's not natural to me. Hence, I was going on about, you know, kind of patting myself on the back for doing uh, practice studies every day. But it's a necessity because I have to have practiced all of those things over the decade to have the versatility because, uh, you know, we did the Prince of Egypt, then we did El Dorado in ancient America. Then we did Spirit in the American West. Then Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas. Then Under the Ocean with Shark Tale. We did the Shrek movies. We did Under the Sewers of London and Flushed Away. We did the Elephant movie. We did, um, ne I, I did, you know, Peter Pan's Never Neverland with Disney. And uh, we did, we designed an entire theme park with uh, Paramount, Wonder Park, and innumerable, you know, the projects just go on and on. I don't know about all those subjects. And we have to hit, uh, in all of those different subject materials, we have to be able to do any time of day, any lighting scenario, any story moment, any mood and emotion. 
that is that is millions of possibilities it is crippling and yet we have to have a versatility to be able to tackle uh, that range. And so when I see a portfolio that shows an arc of storytelling and you know in lighting design, shape design, sketching, finished work, I'm just really enthusiastic. This is a person that can come in and really tell a story and get the job done. So that's my strong recommendation. You actually have um, some exercises that kind of align with what you're saying where you you i believe this is designing color and light you give uh, a sketch or sometimes like a 3d model like a um or mm -hmm. an image of a 3d model and you have to design the light yourself to create the certain mood that you want right i'm thinking about the puss in boots absolutely one. Uh, yeah yeah yeah, we've done several of those and part of my, my color and light workout on schoolism and that that fits pretty well because that set up, uh, you know, we're all busy. So they're kind of 45 minute paintings where we provide the resource, we provide the model or a snapshot and the applicable photo references. And then I, I do a demo and you guys paint along, you know, over 45 minutes and then you're able to get on with what you need to do with your day and get that practice in. And so in, in that and and other workouts and classes uh we we do there's a sketch or a model and then it's our job paint over top of it create the lighting that's appropriate for the mood that tells the story and particularly and here's an exercise i strongly recommend uh do a sketch you know sketch a scene make up a scene uh that, that you like and then tackle it 10 different ways, give it sunset lighting, give it overcast lighting. Maybe there's some magic going on, some magical light, maybe shining out of the building or onto the building, uh, give it artificial lighting. And so light it and color it in 10 and give, maybe give it atmosphere. One moment it's misty or, or foggy and another moment it has heavy, maybe it has weather and rain. Do it 10 completely different ways so that the exact same scene has a completely different mood. If you can do that, if you can give the same exact scene 10 completely different moods, you're well on your way to being a storyteller. I remember one of your most impressive uh, posts or images that I've seen from you are all of these studies out of the same window, out of you know your place at DreamWorks or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're all different. yeah. It's it, it's funny. I did that during uh, El Dorado was a particularly hard movie for me. It was only my second show. I was hired on the Prince of Egypt because my natural my way of painting fit. It kind of lent itself to what the Prince of Egypt was trying to do, and so that was a really great fit. I was able to contribute, you know, and and uh, and really uh, be a part of that. And then El Dorado was an amazing style. It had a different approach. It had a different kind of a graphic. And I had to kind of, uh, you know, what I did on autopilot now no longer, I couldn't do autopilot anymore. And I had to kind of restructure. Uh, and so I needed to take breaks. And so what I did is it, funny because uh, uh, those 70 paintings I did staring out my office window, it's a careful record of me doing something other than what I was actually being. I was just sitting, you know, we all want to sit and stare out the window instead of work, which is exactly what I did. I just said, hey, I have paints right here in front of me all on my acrylics. I'm going to do a little painting. I'm going to take a 20, 30 minute break uh, and do a painting. I did a, something like 70 of these over the course of a year. And uh, it was actually very informative uh, about how very different a landscape can feel emotionally at different times of day and under different weather conditions. So, yeah, that was actually, uh, you know, we all need to take a break from work. And that was a useful way to do it. Um, uh, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, Is go ahead. Is it okay if I could ask? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I really like your stories that you're telling us uh, on this live chat, uh, Nathan. <laughs> is, uh, I haven't really practiced the question, so I'm just uh, sorry if I if it comes out like 
not right way um so i'm kind of um, like artists do uh paint a lot and draw and everything uh, but there's also another part of uh being an artist and that's like being your own uh, entrepreneur um so my question is like what how do you what prices do you charge like how do you think uh, on more of a entrepreneurship side to the being an artist and how can you survive on being an uh, independent artist not having a studio you work in um that type of thing uh yeah that's a very courage to do that Um, that's a that's a critical question and uh you know it's just the nature uh if you're going to be an artist it's also a business you know uh and, and that's that's how the world works uh, we we do something, we train ourselves to do something that's valuable for other people. And then, you know, and then we and, and then we negotiate with them, you know, about how valuable it really is for them. And, and that's the name of the game is to develop a skill set that means you have something valuable to bring to the table. Because uh, if you have valuable skills uh, to offer, you know, unique and valuable skills, uh, that means you got a shot at having a unique and valuable life. It's so important. So I'm glad you asked. Uh, so there's a, a couple of resources out there where you can go a little bit deeper. We mm-hmm. did, uh, Bobby and I did a series. Uh, it's on my, uh, it, it's all put together in in one section. If you just go to my YouTube page and kind of scroll down through the playlist, there's a playlist called The Core and then the second season of the core. And I don't remember exactly which it is, but we did a talk on quoting, uh, uh, pricing your artwork, pricing your skills, pricing your work. And there's Mm -hmm. some ideas in there that I think might be helpful for you where you can spend a little more time. So check out that video. Also, we mentioned at the top, and so I'd like to mention it again. I did a talk specifically about this, the one we mentioned before for Lightbox Expo. Uh, if you go to lightboxexpo.com, it's there. It's also on my YouTube page in the first playlist. If you just scroll to the last of that playlist, it's called the Bulletproof Freelance Career. Mm-hmm. Because what I found, even though I, I've very diligently worked my way up to being with the uh, you know the AAA studios and the AAA projects, it happens all the time. I'm on a project and everything's great. And then the project evaporates. The studio cancels the project out of nowhere. Well, even if I have a lot of contacts and a lot of background and uh, a, a, a great resume, it's going to take me, you know, a, a mo- it might take me a month to find another movie. There's only so many movies happening. It might take two months to find another movie. What am I going to do during those two months? And so what I talk about in this Bulletproof Freelance Career Talk, I talk about my plan A, B, C, D. I literally have plan A through F. And I talk about a situation where I literally had to fall back on plan F. Not duration, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F. And I I have that many things that I've worked out to create an income stream. And I was once in a situation where it went all the way to plan F. And thank goodness plan F was in place because it saved me. So I want to recommend to you and anyone else that they're listening, you know, we want to have a good career. We want to maybe hope to earn a comfortable living. And uh, it's required to make those kinds of distinctions. So do check out those resources. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Talk about being prepared right on. Yeah. How, how, yeah. <laughs> how do you not get discouraged when your plan A fails, for example, or B till, till the F point? Uh, yeah. Uh, listen to heavy metal music. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, I, I actually I tell I, I tell tongue in cheek, but in in that talk, you know, I, I tell a story. It relates to my I had a med- I, I kind of hate mentioning the medical situation because you know a guy always hates to sound. You know, my wife teases me because I never like to 
uh, show weakness. You know, I can't stand showing weakness. And that's why I always make a big point. No, I, I did go, I went through this medical situation last year, but, uh, you know, it took, it was a six month recovery, fought my way through it. I'm back to a completely back to a hundred percent. I just have to wear this eye patch. No problem. You know, one eye, I'm a 2D artist. It makes no difference. So I always have to say I'm great. I'm a hundred percent. Uh, uh, but um, I, I tell the story in that that Lightbox Expo talk. Um, I, I I during that recovery, I almost could not stand. You know, I couldn't stand up. I had to shuffle around. I had to shuffle my way to the studio. So I had this really loud, aggressive music I would listen to. It's positive music. You know, I I, I like loud, aggressive, even heavy metal, but I like kind of the, the um, power metal, the fun, you know, hey, we're going to get out there. We're going to do something, you know, the really great. Let's get up and go. Uh, and so I would listen to this music and to get to force an adrenaline rush so I could literally stand up and claw my way to the studio. And I had this one particular song about this gladiator knowing he might die so you know is this loud aggressive but he's doing it anyway you know he stands up the crowd cheers and he fights he he walks in the studio he walks as a studio that's a freudian slip he walks into the arena fearless you know and i would listen to this you know and in my mind i would hear the crowds cheering but in real life you know i'm all hunched over you know kind of clawing my shuffling uh uh, you know, my way out to the studio and then sitting, I couldn't lift my head up. You know, the surgery was on my neck that I went through. I actually rigged, I rigged to, I couldn't look at my, I couldn't bend my head down to look at my keyboard. So I rigged up a double mirror so I could look into the mirror and see my keyboard. You have to have a double mirror. Otherwise it'll be backwards and it'll get confused. So I did not have to, cause I could not bend my head down to look at the keyboard and at my, uh, uh, tablet. And so I rigged up this mirror so I could still work. And, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, uh, don't ask what what the band was or the song was, because if I tell you, everyone's going to say, oh, that, that's horrible. That, I can't believe you listen to that crap, Nathan. It's horrible. You guys don't have to like what I like, but you've got to find, you know, whatever gets your blood pumping. You know, whatever it is, find what it is, uh, uh, music or, uh, you know, music and exercise, particularly exercise is very critically important. Uh, I have a couple of weights at my desk. I just do hand curls, not because I want to build muscle strength, but because it wakes me up and I get a rush, you know, I get a temporary rush out of it. And then I can, I'm sleepy, but then I can focus again for 20 minutes. So whatever it is, it gets your blood pumping. Um, it pops you out of that discouragement. And uh, even if it's just for 20 minutes, but then in that 20 minutes, you get some momentum going. And once that momentum starts going, your excitement comes up and then you get into that state of flow that an artist needs to be in. And then things start to click. Then your brain really works and things come together. Thank you, Nathan. You got it. And Bobby, the painting is looking great. Uh, the way you guys, where you're going with, uh, with the Magma Studio painting. Oh, Thank you. That's yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yay. Yeah, this was fun. This was a really fun one. And mm -hmm. say you did such a great job. Thank you. Couldn't do it without you. <laughs> That's what Nighty Mac is all about. It's all about encouragement, positive vibes, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't have to be super competitive to get ahead. Uh, you know, you just got to work hard and do your thing. Here's a, another question off of Slido. This one's from Penn. Penn says, Mr. Faux, is it good to make art that people can tell was made by you without having to sign your name, i.e. to have an art style? I thought this was particularly interesting because, you know, we work in an industry where it's like you, you want to stand out, but also your, your main objective is to create a part of a bigger thing yeah that is a great question and i'm already you know in my mind i'm framing a couple things that i could just go on and on about I, I'll, I'll try not to do that uh and and try and and cut cut straight to the chase about it 
because as with most things, it's a balancing act. You know, we, we all know that, you know, there's always too much of a good thing. And so sure, to have a style, well, it's likely that we will have a style. You know, we're an individual, we find ways of working that make sense to us. And so those ways, you know, those processes will be identifiable and we might like a particular look or a particular way. For instance, one person might emphasize shapes more and they might design based on uh, shapes of local colors and values. Another person might really love light and shadow and really design the shapes of light and shadow instead of the shapes of actual objects as, as part of their style. You know, and there's so many different ways that we can go. And so uh, it's likely that we will have a style and it's likely that that'll be identifiable. Where that becomes a problem, too much of a good thing is when our style becomes a formula. Because uh, I, we mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, there are so many different subjects, just endless subjects, and they can be handled in so many different ways with so many different lighting and atmospheric scenarios. And they can have so many different kinds of emotions applied to them just endlessly. Well, if you have a hard form style that rises to the level of a formula, that means you're going to treat all of those different subjects and all of those different possibilities in exactly the same way. What a shame. You know, what a tragedy. All that possibility and you're treating them all by some predictable formula. That's where it goes too far. And so that's what I want to encourage people just to watch out and make sure they're not crossing that line. And I'll, I'll, I will say one thing further. Uh, some people, I'm a little bit more generalist in terms of style, which has actually really served me in my career because we have to jump from project to project and scenario to scenario. And so we have to have a certain amount of adaptability. So what often there's an amazing artist with an incredible style. We all love that work. We love that artist and uh, I'm in favor of it. And, uh, and a, a studio will say, hey, you know, we have a story idea and this artist who we saw their work out on Instagram, they have such a unique and amazing style. It would be perfect for this story. And they bring in that person and that person's a hero, you know, and maybe they art direct the project. Sometimes the projects actually happen. Sometimes they get canceled and, it, you know, doesn't doesn't go the distance. And so that artist has this amazing opportunity. But what that also means is when that project's over, what are the chances that there's going to be a movie that needs exactly that person's style? It's just not so likely, you know? And so they have a little bit of a box. They're in a little bit of a box they have to deal with. And so that artist has to be prepared. You know, they'll work on a movie or a video game and be a leader. But then a couple of years will go by and there's no project that wants or needs that style. They're going to they're going to spend that time, you know, they're going to work on their graphic novel. They're going to be working on their book. They're going to be expressing that style, doing their own personal project, because if they don't, they got nothing. And so that's one of the limitations that we have to be prepared for when we go to greater extremes of style. Awesome. Every answer you give is so awesome. I hope everybody saves this video so you can go back to it anytime that you want and you can take some notes. I know I'm going to be listening to this again myself, not having mm -hmm. to worry about running this stream and just listen to these stories, listen to these lessons. I uh, just want to say thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much for oh, hanging out with yeah. us. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I love I love talking art and hanging out hanging out with the crew here and thank everyone for uh, joining in with us. Absolutely. And I also want to thank of course the amazing mods in our LBX Discord. Thank you so much for making uh, you know the LBX Discord such a wonderful positive place to hang out and learn art. And of course, I want to thank my amazing assistant jamie thank you so much for being in youtube and uh you know helping everybody out there and everybody in youtube and my co-host of course miss a Saki. thank you miss a that's fine <laughs> thanks everybody yeah really appreciate yeah, thanks, it everyone. 
Uh, one last thing I want to mention tomorrow, we're going to be doing a stream with the Paintathon winners uh, from our last uh, Holly Jolly Paintathon, Nathan. That was the right. name of the event. We did a 24 hour <laughs> right. Paintathon. Um, and everybody joined together to create groups to paint with. Mm -hmm. And so nobody had to do it all nighter. You'll be happy to know. Um, <laughs> the, the magma, yeah, the magma sharing app. This is this is a real breakthrough. What what you guys are doing with with the app? So this is exciting. And tomorrow you can join us with the winners. We will be painting with the winners tomorrow. Uh, you know, doing an art jam and everything. So come back and join us for that. As for now, I, I just want to say thank you so much for joining in and we'll see y'all next time.